You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. We present Selling One Soul by John Fryer with Ben Morris and Annabelle Spinks-Jones. Perhaps we should get down to the real business of this morning, the true agenda for today. You may, of course, Lawrence. I'm sure your time is valuable. I know that mine is. Precisely. Now, you see, my firm, Finborough Holdings, has been approached to make presentations to your good self with regards to one of the biggest scourges of our time. It is a scandal that so many of our citizens are living in substandard, overpriced housing that leaves almost no potential for growth and advancement. They cannot save. They cannot move beyond what they have. They are, in effect, trapped. We are the lucky ones, Rupert. Born in the right time, well-educated, the right sort, and of the old-school tie. But what of those that are below us on the property ladder of life? I'm new to this brief, Lawrence, that is correct. And there is much in what you say, but the government, under the leadership of the Prime Minister, has set out a bold and ambitious plan for the building of 200,000 houses every year until the next general election. I've been looking at some local government files recently, and it appears that this country has some of the most deprived areas in the whole of Europe. This is a national disgrace, and clearly something must be done, and done quickly. You sound like you have a proposal. I do indeed. In fact, that is the main reason for coming to see the Minister for Housing this very day. You see, Rupert, the area, the most deprived area of Europe, is in the area of Brenton-on-Trent in Sussex. Now, Brenton-on-Trent may seem to you, me, and everyone else that passes it on the main road as a forgotten wasteland of poverty and deprivation. But I see opportunity, especially for the thousands of poor people that live there. You make it all sound rather gloomy. But it doesn't have to be like this, Rupert, for there is a light on the horizon. Oh, this should be good. Good? It is more than good, Rupert. It is inspired and, more importantly, doable. Hmm. So, Lawrence, what do you suggest we do with all these uh, horrible poor people that you clearly feel are such a plague on the town of Brenton-on-Trent? Rupert, I'm glad you asked me that, because I have a radical proposal for you. A radical proposal? But one for which I am sure you will agree the benefits speak for themselves. Let's have it, then. You should move the poor people of Brenton-on-Trent... To Sunderland. What? Now, I have some paperwork here that I think you might find rather interesting. Move half a town? It's actually about a third. 300 miles north? 286 is closer to the mark. In one go? Phased implementation, I think you'll find, is the current consideration. A five-point plan of about 2,000 at each stage over roughly a 12-month period. Forced displacement of people from one end of this nation to the other? Of course not, Rupert. No one is suggesting they go as far as Scotland. I had no idea this was the subject for today's meeting. It's been under wraps for some time, but a lot of good solid work has already been done. If I may bring your attention to Section 3 of the Interactions in Society and Structural Policy Review, the report that I have brought with me here today, I think this office has already received a pre-published copy. Lawrence, I saw you were down to meet my predecessor, who I know was such a soft touch that the likes of you could wrap him round your little finger. 
But you and I have some history between us. Those photos from the party in Sedgefield all those years ago have never come out. And I know what you and those like you in your so-called industry do for a living. But not so with me. The PM will not. And neither would I, if my political career depended on it, actively seek to financially cleanse the poorer parts of this country. It's the likes of you, Lawrence, that have reduced the offices of state to little more than dispensers of government checks. Government should not just be about lobbying for commercial business interests. There are moral reasons that people stand for high office. Those of us on this side of the desk seek to build a better society, not just profit off the backs of those at the bottom of it. I find your proposal, if that is even what it is, hollow, cruel, nasty, and unworthy of this department. Now, leave, before I have you thrown out. Well, I am more than a little disappointed, Rupert, by your attitude on this one. I thought we had something of an understanding before we both arrived this morning. But I now see that I was mistaken. The only issues that lobbying companies like yours perform, Lawrence, is the agenda of those that rarely wish to show themselves to the full scrutiny of daylight. I feel that you have not considered this proposal from all of its positive angles. There are no positive angles other than you exiting this office. Or should I call security? No need, Rupert. We shall not stay where we are not wanted. Come, Miranda, let us take our argument where we shall find a more receptive ear. And you, young lady, is this really the career path that you wish to follow? Selling your soul for the next corporate suit that walks through the door with a check in his hand? Well, I... You're all the same. So you think all politicians are... You're wrong. I believe in what I'm doing, and I'm doing it because I know it's right. Get out, the pair of you. I'm, I'm guessing that did not go exactly as you intended. Sorry? Um, that meeting. Um, that can't have been what you planned. On the contrary. As soon as I learned it was Rupert Bolingbroke, I knew that my chances were slim to zero. Rupert is the type to hold a grudge. Most people are. There are very few that will really let bygones be bygones. Still, we should not allow ourselves to be downhearted at the first negative reception of our plan. Our plan? Rupert was correct. We've taken the money and now we must make the sale. You are here with me, part of the team, first day on the job, baptism of fire and all that. I didn't do anything. You did all the talk. Elvira, we must not get caught up with who said this or who did that. When representing the firm, we must act as one. For today, you are also a part of Finborough Holdings. And what exactly does Finborough Holdings do? Has your father not told you in which way he is so gainfully employed? He doesn't talk a lot about the office. He never speaks about the work that he does. Oh. So you have never inquired as to what the old man did all day? He leaves in a suit and tie in the morning and comes home in a suit and tie in the evening. No difference. Five days a week. And yet... You asked to get an inside view of the firm. I wanted to do work experience at the local theatre. Ah, yes. A budding actress. You may scoff. Oh, and what happened to that line of inquiry? They were oversubscribed. Frequently the case in the theatre, from what I've heard. But don't let that deter you, young Michel, for performers take on many roles and the most successful are not necessarily on the stage. I like being on the stage. So many do. 
If only there were enough audiences for you all to appear in front of. Thanks. Maybe your time will come, Louise. Maybe you shall be adored by those that know so little about you. In some respects, we do the very same. You've just been thrown out of the minister's office. Have I? Who told you that? I was thrown out with you? (laughs) What a strange way you have of remembering. I was standing right next to you. You think we were thrown out? No, no, no. We had a perfectly amicable meeting on the pros and cons of the commercial benefits and opportunities of the economic advantages and employment prospects for workers in Brenton on Trent to move to more affluent parts of the country. But we were told to get out before you even began to outline any economic benefits to anyone, and certainly not the people of Brenton on Trent if indeed there are any benefits. Young Barbara, although to the uninitiated in the dark arts of Whitehall, this morning's meeting may have appeared an abject failure, or even a complete waste of time, to the experienced watcher of such things, it served one very important purpose. Have you worked it out yet? All I saw was Finbra Holdings get a tongue lashing from a man you did in 20 years ago, And he remembered you. Then let me tell you this, my young apprentice. Right now, on the nation's public radio, a man called Simon Williamson from the Rosenholm Think Tank is talking up the economic case for the displacement of everyone earning under £18,000 a year to cheaper parts of the country. One of the many points that he will make during this interview is the positive view the government is taking of the very report that we presented to the newly appointed minister, Mr. Rupert Bolingbroke, only this morning. But he didn't... That is your interpretation of how the meeting went. All I can say is that a commercial courier has a signature to prove that just such a report was received at the Ministry this very morning. Whether the Minister claims to have read it is completely beside the point, isn't it? So, when you went to see him this morning, making out that you and the ex-Minister for Housing went back all those years, it really didn't matter who the Minister was. You had already arranged the radio interview and the delivered report. I see you catch on quick, young Charlotte. Control the ground, and you control the argument. The minister, whoever he or she shall be, will argue morals. My friend Simon will already be arguing money. And we both know what makes the world go round. All you had to do was get in the door and put the minister on the back foot. I see the logic. You flatter me. But he still said no. How are you going to change his mind? The same way you get anyone to change their mind on anything. You appear confused. I'm just thinking. You bring pressure to bear. You mean like an advertising campaign? Well, we try to be a little more substantial than that. We are the players that the world does not see. Those that whisper in the ears of those that make them decisions. We are the people that think outside that which confines us. We are the ones that make things happen. Wouldn't the minister like to say that he was the one that made things happen? I'm sure he would, and if asked, you should argue that he is indeed the one that pulled the strings. And the truth? We stay in the shadows and pull his strings. It's more fun there, I assure you. I'm joined this morning by Simon Williamson from the Rosenholm Think Tank, an institute that has been looking at the question of social deprivation in Britain. Good morning, Simon. Good morning. Now, your organisation has come up with, so I'm told, some pretty creative solutions to the issues of social mobility. Thank you, Jane. We at the Rosenholm Institute have commissioned a report into this very problem. Can I stop you there, Simon? Because you were good enough to send us an advanced copy of this report, and 
There are some very radical suggestions indeed contained within it. We invited Dr Raymond Jones, a very respected expert in his field, to look at the subject of social deprivation in this country. And on page uh, 27 of his highly detailed report, he's put forward a number of possible solutions, including the moving of whole communities away from the southeast of England to less prosperous areas in the north of the country. Well, there are several different locations under consideration, Jane. The report does not limit itself purely to one part of the country over another. Housing costs especially here in the South, are, of course, a well-known factor with reference to the difficulty that many on low incomes face. The reduction of free school meals, for example, would allow local authorities to put more of that money back into education for all of our children. But that is only because, under this proposal, you are suggesting sending away the poor into less affluent areas elsewhere in the country. Where housing is cheaper... And so even those still required to lean on the public purse will now be less of a burden to the taxpayer. Good news for our children, communities, businesses and the hard-working people of this country.